Welcome to the Brain Tech Podcast. I'm Zach Goldblum. In this first episode, I'm joined by Dick Moberg, medical device entrepreneur and leader in neurological monitoring. His pioneering work has helped shape the field over the past 40 years. In our conversation, we talk about entrepreneurship and cover the advancements that led us into the modern era of neurocritical care and the technologies that are ushering us into the future. Enjoy the episode. Well, hi, Dick. Welcome to the podcast. You're here on the uh, episode number one. It's great to have you on. Well, it's great to be here, Zach, and I'm honored. <laughs> well, I guess we'll start off with a bit of your background. So you graduated from University of Pennsylvania back in the 1970s as an electrical engineer. Uh, how'd you get your start in the medical field? <clears throat> so it was, um, I think in the medical field, my, you know, my mother, I guess, trained me from when I was two years old that I was going to be her little doctor. And so I was programmed to, you know, going out and I, and I developed a, a really intense um, interest in, uh, in medicine and research. And, um, you know, it just came about that when I was in, um, went to a boarding school and my roommate's father was the head of neurosurgery at Yale University. And we'd sneak off uh, on the weekends because it was an all boys school. So we'd sneak out of town mm -hmm. and go down to Yale. And um, he was great. He took me into his lab and just showed me all about brain research. And, you know, that was the introduction. And uh, I got bit by it. And, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to be. Gotcha. So what was it like? What was um, the standard of care like for the brain then? Like, what was brain research like? What was um, neurocritical care like? Well, neurocritical care as a field didn't even exist back then. You know, it was um, it was actually pretty sad. I mean, uh, you know, the brain is so complicated that, you know, it's the organ that's still really a frontier, you know, compared to what we know about, about other parts of the body. <clears throat> and, you know, I ended up working for a neurosurgeon after that and, and uh, right near my senior year in college. And Around that time, it was um, you, you. If you came in with a with a head injury, a severe head injury, um, your likelihood of survival was very, very low. And in fact, what they did is they just treated you symptomatically, and you know they treated other organ problems, other you know organs that were injured, and they basically just put you in a corner and you know just uh, saw what happened. And, and that's that's the truth. You really there's really no intensive brain therapy so. right and was that more of a like a lack of understanding of the brain or we just didn't have the technologies developed yet well i think it was both i mean if you think about the 70s they didn't even have imaging back then i mean you had x-rays but you couldn't take x-rays through the head through the bone so you didn't have ct scans or mri <clears throat> and what you did have was eeg and eeg really was the imaging source back then so they would put a, an array of electrodes on your head and, and less so for trauma, but for tumors, you know, if you had a tumor near the surface of your brain, you could see a slowing in the EG uh, right where the tumor was. So EEG sort of became, was the imaging modality. And then they also had something called pneumoencephalography where they, they actually put air in your spinal cord, spinal column, and um, in the CSF and the air went up and would uh, go into the spaces where the fluid should be, and then they'd take an x-ray, and you could see the air versus the, you know, the rest of the, um, the brain. The normal x-rays would differentiate that, but not the tissues. And those were called pneumoencephalograms. And my, what I hear is they were one of the most painful things you could ever go through. So it was <laughs> it like, sounds uh, painful. it was like, you know, first you have no idea what's going on in the brain. And, and then you do your best to torture the patients that have just had a head injury or something. <laughs> so um, it, it wasn't a good time. <laughs> right, so clearly that's not used in modern neurocritical care, but EEG still is. EEG is, and it, and it actually uh, uh, declined in use when the CT scan came about in the 80s, uh, but it was used then more in epilepsy stuff. So. Okay, so, um, you're obviously an entrepreneur. Um, you founded many companies and have recently founded Moberg Analytics. But what was your first company? And um, did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Well, no. <clears throat> um, you know, I always thought I'd be uh, in medicine. I thought I'd be doing research. I, I sort of, in my mind, had a had a um, sort of a career plan. You know, maybe going down to NIH and spending some years, and then 
you know, working in, um, in I, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon and I worked for a neurosurgeon as an engineer. And then a couple of things changed. So one thing is I kept talking to the, um, the residents in neurosurgery and one of them who was also sort of technically inclined said, you know, once you've done 10 or 20 spinal cases and 10 or 20 tumors and 10 or 20 of this and that, he says, it gets kind of um, not not interesting anymore. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I sort of say, wow, that, how can being a neurosurgeon not be interesting? But, you know, he sort of knew my interest in technology. And then the other thing that happened is I, um, it was one of these chance encounters, which is the way a lot of things happen is I, I was in the parking lot in the engineering school at Penn and this professor of mine uh, saw me and he had just started a new company and um, he knew that, that I had learned about microcomputers sort of on my own and I had started this uh, uh, computer club for that in Philadelphia and, and all that. And I was actually teaching old engineers um, new tricks with microcomputers. So he knew that and he said, hey, do you wanna come uh, help us out in this new company? And I was at the point where my PhD was sort of floundering. It was, I could never settle on the topic and so, um, I thought, well, this is great. I'll go work with them and I'll, um, I'll see if I can get my PhD done while I'm working with them. And I'd taken a, a leave from medical school. So, uh, so that's how I got into it. And then, you know, uh, six months into it, we realized we couldn't build the product they wanted to build, but they had all this, uh, they had all this venture money that they had to spend. And I came up with this idea for a little, um, little brain monitor from my work in the neurosurgery department. Uh, which was down at Jefferson. And together with this other guy, Gary, we built this product. And then within a, really within a record time, within 18 months, it was like, it was out on the market, you know, cleared by the FDA. And we were selling them all over the world. And I got, I got uh, hooked on industry, you know, and never, never went back to my, my MD or my PhD. And uh, right. never, never thought I'd be in industry. So that's how I got into it. It was really by walking through a parking lot <laughs> or being at the right place in the right time, which is the way a lot of things happen. So. Right. But it was that, that sort of like excitement of always doing something new that really had drew you to that as opposed to um, going into medicine. Yeah, totally. And because uh, medicine was the expected, industry was the unexpected. And I probably gravitate to the unexpected, you know, like, like I think a lot of people do. Right. And it was the same thing with, right. uh, you know, brains, my interest in brains, when I went to visit this neurosurgeon, it was new and that really, uh, really caught me. So, but that's how I got into industry. And I think you can do, you know, my, um, you know, industry is just a different way of doing the same thing academics do. It's just a different environment, different rules. You have a lot of mm -hmm. the same problems. Um, a lot of the same gratification, but so, so I'm happy with it. Right. And what do you find gratifying about it? Well, I think the one thing, I think you have to be, if you're the kind of person like I am, um, I, I, if I come up with an idea or whatever, I'd like to pursue it. And I, I think you can really, there are very few environments where you can do that uh, unless you basically own a company and you can say, I have an idea and I, now go do it you know, to the people that you work with. Um, you know, you can do that in academia. I think it's harder. I think there's a couple of there are barriers there. Now, if you have an idea in academia and you go out and get a lot of grant money, that's the green light, right? So money sort of drives your ideas, I think, in academia. Um, and in industry, they do too. I mean, you have to fund it both places. But I, I think it was really having control of my, of my life is really what, um, you know, what the gratifying part was on uh, in industry. Right, and there's something there is something really enticing about having this vision or an idea in your brain, and then creating the company and everything surrounding to bring that idea to reality. Something yeah, uh, you know, and, really and, amazing uh, there. And you probably have the seeds of that with the uh, invention you made while working for me with this uh, Stopcock sensor. I'm very proud of you for that. But, you know, it's there's there's a lot to it from having an idea and getting that idea, you know, into um, 
into a practice and into a sellable product that's accepted sure. in the market and everything. And uh, that's that's where a lot of the effort goes. And, and hopefully you'll experience that soon. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a I'm great sure. learning curve. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm sure there's lots to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump forward a bit um, and talk about what a modern neurointensive care unit looks like. So what are the, some of the, the modalities that they use in a modern ICU? And um, what can these modalities tell us about the brain and the patient? So, um, you know, the, the, um, the sad thing is that not a whole lot's changed, you know, from uh, way back then to now. And it's, um, I, I think that's one of the things that's kept me going is seeing if we can actually make a difference in this field. Now, the, the one big thing that did happen that I alluded to before is imaging, right? Imaging came in with CT scans and MRIs and the functional imaging. And I mean, it just, that's just skyrocketed. And that's given doctors a, a picture of what goes on in the brain uh, to where, you know, you come in with any kind of brain injury and you immediately get a CT scan or an MRI. So it really has, in its own way, it's revolutionized the field. But that's a, you know, that's a static image that's done, you know, periodically. It's, it's not monitoring. It's not, you, you know, you, you, you don't have that temporal uh, data that can guide you in the care. Like if you give a drug to a patient, how did, how did that change them? Did that change, did it do any good? You need the constant continuous monitoring to do that. And that's where um, I think uh, neurocritical care has lacked, uh, but I think that's where we're helping to make a difference. Now, there's a lot of little companies that have uh, sprung up that each have their own little brain measurement so, uh, you know, intracranial pressure is one that's been around for a long time, and there are now many companies that make those monitors, several different technologies. Uh, brain oxygen is one that uh, came about about 20 years ago, where you put a little probe in the brain, and you can measure the oxygen, which is a great way to see how the brain's uh, working, or at least uh, getting the food it needs. And you can also do that non-invasively with, near, with near-infrared spectroscopy. So, that's another one. Then transcranial Doppler, um, on and on. Bl brain perfusion monitoring, uh, blood flow, and all that. So, so all those monitors uh, came about really over the past 20 years, but they were all one monitor with one measurement. And I think what we did um, was to put them all together. And and that's, I think that's what somebody needed to do, and that's what we did. So. Right. And so the product that you had created to do that. Um, was that your company, Moberg Research, recreated the CNS monitor. And that was the technology that, you know, enabled this multimodal monitoring where you could see all these different modalities that you mentioned, like your brain oxygen, your heart rate, your blood pressure. Um, and you could see them all time synchronous. So you can see how, you know, one thing changing is affecting the other and how medications can, you know, alter more than one modality at once. So could you um, speak a little bit more about, um, I guess, sort of like the conception behind the CNS monitor and um, some of the research that went into creating that? Yeah, sure. So um, my, my two products before that were mostly used in anesthesia and, and in, uh, in surgery. So the very first product just monitored EEG and evoked potentials in, in uh, surgery. So you're looking at you know, is the surgeon doing more damage to the brain when they operate on like the carotid arteries? You know, are they gonna restrict the blood flow to where the brain has problems? Or likewise in spinal cord surgery, you know, you um, uh, if you're operating on the spine, are you gonna paralyze the patient when you're just trying to take out a tumor or something? Um, so they, they were there to uh, monitor the nervous system during surgery. The second product, did EEG and evoke potential simultaneous, first product ever done that, and it also did transcranial Doppler, so you could connect that in there. So with those two products, I kept adding more and more modalities, and it just became clear that the more data you have, the better decisions you can make, right? And then I saw the opportunity in, um, so, so my second product was, um, was sold, and I saw the opportunity in critical care. And at that time, that was in the um, late 90s. 
some of these new uh, brain monitors were coming out. And it, it looked, you, you sort of needed somebody to bring all these measurements together. So the same problem we had in the OR uh, was in the IC only was worse. And so I sort of decided to switch to uh, back to head injury, which is what the field I loved all along and uh, do it there. And so it was really just a concept. I had no idea what the market would be like. I had no idea whether, um, you know, how difficult this was gonna be. So it really was just an idea with very little planning. <laughs> and I decided right, this is something, what I'm gonna do. Yeah, right? this is something so novel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So could you talk about a bit more about um, like why this multimodal approach is important and how it's, you know, more advantageous than looking at these different modalities separated or non-time synchronized? Yeah, well, I think you alluded to it, but it's it's really, again, more the more data you have, the better you can do. So an example would be, um, <clears throat> so we know that seizures uh, can, can rob the oxygen from surrounding tissue, right? And if you have an area of injured brain and then you have seizures, uh, the, the, the seizure can sort of rob the oxygen from that region around the injured brain called a penumbra. That penumbra area uh, could either um, over time go, go become healthy or it could become dead, all right? So that area around the already injured area. And that's the area where you want to concentrate because you don't want that injury to spread, right? You want to contain the injury, keep the tissue healthy. So now you have a seizure and it's sort of uh, requiring a whole lot of uh, the metabolites because it's a hyper metabolic activity in the nerve cells. So you're robbing that oxygen from that penumbra, all right? And now the question is, and, and then what we also know, another thing we know about seizures is that decrease in oxygen in the brain can cause seizures, all right? So we know these two things. So now let's say you're monitoring a patient, all right? And, and you, um, and what you do is you see, um, you see a seizure and you see the oxygen decrease, all right? Now that makes sense. But which one happened first, all right? So the thing is, did the oxygen go down first and that caused the seizure? Or did the seizure happen, which, create, which robbed the oxygen around your probe and it went down there? Now, if you put all the data together and time synchronize it, you could see causality you can see which one caused the other, all right? And so if you see the seizures are causing the hypoxia, you treat the seizures. If the hypoxia is causing the seizures, you just increase the oxygen, turn up the ventilator FiO2, all right? And maybe you stop the seizures. So by having that data, now this is sort of a hypothetical example, but it's one that I think is real. And having that data together and highly time synchronized, would tell you how to treat a patient in that condition. Whereas if you didn't have it synchronized, you would see a seizure over on one instrument, an EEG machine, see the hypoxia maybe on the other machine, and you'd have no idea how to treat it. You may just treat the seizures, but you know maybe they're being caused by the hypoxia that you didn't see. So, um, so those are the kind of things. And then you can see, if a nurse gives a drug, uh, you can see the action of the drug on the brain, which is very helpful to the nurse getting the confidence that what they're doing is actually helping the patient rather than just following directions they're given you know, by the docs. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that come out of this that um, most of them are just common sense. you know. <laughs> so. Right, but revealing that causality is very important to see you know, what's causing which because that helps direct the treatment pathway for that patient. And that can yeah. you know, significantly alter the patient outcomes. So that's obviously a very um, impactful thing that uh, this multimodal monitoring reveals. Yeah, and then the other thing in, in, in neurocortical care is a lot of the, um, the, the big sort of dirty secret in neurocritical care is that they have this limit that your ICP, your intracranial pressure, should not go above 22. Well, that number was largely just made up. <laughs> and, you know, if you, you could be at an intracranial pressure of 30 and your brain could be doing just fine, you know, and um, it, it's, it's this little secret. And, and you can tell that when you do multimodal monitoring, you can look at the brain oxygen. You know, one of the problems if the brain swells and the pressure goes up is it creates 
uh, more pressure in the head than the heart can overcome by pumping the blood up to your brain, right? So you don't get enough blood up to the brain. Well, if you're measuring brain oxygen, all right, you're measuring the action of the heart by measuring brain oxygen, measuring the action of the heart in its role in perfusing the brain. If you're measuring that and you look at the brain pressure, what's more important is not the pressure, it's the oxygen. It's that the brain's getting the blood. And so we have mm -hmm. clinicians now that do not, they, they ignore the intracranial pressure and it can go way above the given threshold as long as the oxygen, they're reading an adequate oxygen, you know, reading from the brain. So that's another way that, um, you know, that this thing can, um, can help you give more precise care in the brain. And that's where all the medicine's heading is in precision medicine. And it's just now creeping into uh, neurocritical care. Right. So speaking of the future of medicine, let's talk about your latest venture, Moberg Analytics. Can you give us sort of an introduction to uh, Moberg Analytics? What are some of the goals? Um, where do you want to take this company? Sure. So, so um, you know, it's really the next step in um, my career, and I just hope I live long enough to pull it off. You know, <laughs> but um, and I, I think I will. I'm healthy, so don't worry. All right? <laughs> but um, it's the the next step is that we now can get this great data um, from the brain, you know, from multi, from our product and, and other, other sources, you know. And so the, the issue now is to uh, put this data, uh, so to first to harmonize it, all right, to make sure it's in a standard format and then put it on the cloud. Now the question is, why do you want to do that? Well, the problem all along in neurocritical care is that it's, it's not like a cardiac or cardiology medicine, you know, which where you have tons and tons of patients. I mean, lots of people patients with congestive heart failure and, and um, you know, heart attacks and that kind of stuff. So your your in to study these patients is very high. In neuro, it's it's a much smaller population. So how do you do any meaningful analyses um, with a small number of patients? So within a hospital, it's almost impossible to do any kind of study within one page, within one hospital. You don't have enough patients. So that's why they have these clinical trials that we're involved in, that, that um, you know, this, this one we're involved in now, Boost 3, uh, gets patients from 45 different hospitals around the US and Canada. And now you're starting to build up numbers of patients uh, that you would never see in one or a few institutions. And, and what that does then, of course, is you, you not only have the problems in one hospital of collecting data from all the different devices they use and all the different, you know, from medical records and everything that's just not connected normally, but you multiply that by 45. You multiply all those problems by, you know, by the number there. And that's where I think we, um, we can make a big difference, all right? And so, you know, just this morning, I was talking to a doctor at Seattle Children's Hospital and their big problem, and they're collecting a lot of neuro data on pediatric patients, and they want to share it. And it's just, you know, it's, it's apples to oranges. They share the data they collect in their place with all of the, you know, the different devices they use, the, um, you know, and, and then you want to share it with another hospital that's a completely different uh, data collection environment. So that's where the work we're doing, I think, really is going to make a difference. So you put this on the cloud, you then um, try to standardize our standards, you know, the standards we're developing, that you're, de you're helping to develop and, you know, we all are with the, um, you know, with the uh, data archive formats and all that. <clears throat> and then now you, now you can actually learn about the brain and learn about the injured brain, you know, with uh, AI and machine learning and all these cool techniques. So that's where I'm hoping we'll go. And then eventually, uh, everything we learn with these large patients, I want to be able to have, um, you know, sort of better descriptors of when the brain is is moving in the wrong direction, and then have you be able to send your data from your patient up to the cloud, and have have the analytics in the cloud say, you know, here's what I would involve, here's what I think you should do, you know, <laughs> not that the cloud's going to do that, but you know what I mean. It's going to it's going to send down. It's going to say, you know, well with this. With these features we found, you probably want to do this. You probably want to give this drug. We predict in six hours from now, you know, um, 
your lesion's gonna be larger in size and you're, you know, you're gonna be hypoxic. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking to do. All right, and creating that sort of um, artificial intelligence algorithm that can predict the future state of the patient and you know, advise like a treatment pathway, and that obviously will require you know, tons of data and tons of cases. Um, and you know, to train it properly, it needs this data to be um, you know, harmonized, like you said, where you know, it's standard labels across all these different sites. And so the way you're able to aggregate this data and have it harmonized between these different sites um, lends itself really well you know, to both compiling a large data set to start creating some of these advanced algorithms. And also, it's in a format that lends itself very well to training these algorithms. Yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's really marrying data we've never had with technology that's actually helping every other field except neurocritical care. And uh, I think that's where, we're, we're that glue or that plumbing between the data and these tech, you know, tech, the technology that's allowing your, your iPhone to be so smart, you know, so. Uh, yeah, that's right. a good. so and you know, making I, neurocritical care smart. Exactly right. Yeah, but you know, I think all we're doing is, um, you know, we're if we could, I mean, the, it, we're so far behind that, um, you know, there there's still, as you know, there there's some measurements we do in neurocritical care that don't even have a standard label to them. It's not even in the standard medical dictionary the label for these things. So you know, we have to start right at the beginning. But I think you can start small on this. And there are other technologies around where you can send EEG up to the cloud, and it will it will um, uh, it, it will help you compute a sleep study or score a sleep study. You know, in normally it takes about 45 minutes for to, for a doctor to do that, and when you send the data to the cloud with this one company's product, you can do it in five minutes. So we're already seeing the cloud being used in little areas in neurocritical care, and they have um, cloud technology that can read an MRI now and a CT scan. A lot better than a than a doc can. So you have these, you know, there are a couple of these companies that are sticking their their foot in here, and we want to do it really for this real time data in their critical care. So um, I, I think we can do it. I'm confident enough that there's enough, um, you know, technology out there that's uh, that that's uh, going in ahead of us that we can get some confidence. Yeah. So I mean, it sounds like the cloud and the AR are going to play. Um... You know, very crucial roles in the future of neuro neurocritical care. Um, you know, is this the direction you see the field heading in the next five, ten, or twenty years, or are there other technologies that you think are going to play an important role? You know, Zach, it's a good question. I think the um, you know the whole the thing we really haven't discussed is the business side of this, and <clears throat> that's what blindsided me in my last company. You know, I thought when I started it, I thought um, I thought you know. <clears throat> I was in it, and we had been in it for five years. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, this is not easy, you know, <laughs> connecting all these devices. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's rocket science. It's, it's just you need a lot of engineering. You know, you just need to think mm -hmm. through a lot of things and do it. You know, and it's not like some, you know, brilliant invention. It's just a lot of engineering, far more than we thought. And then 10 years into it, I thought by that time I'd have a yacht, you know, and I'd be out in the Caribbean sailing around. <laughs> and that didn't happen, you know. And then 20 years later, you know, we still hadn't, you know, just now, you know, just then now the field is taking off. And in the meantime, I've had to support the company with, you know, <clears throat> we kid around with bake sales and every other way we could do it, you know, grant money and everything. And so it took a lot longer than I thought. And part of that is, it's hard to sell common sense. I mean, you just, it, it doesn't sell. <laughs> I mean, as, as, mm -hmm. as, as, you know, as much sense as this makes to put all this data together, you can't go into a CFO in a hospital and say, hey, buy this, doesn't it make sense? You have to, you have to either be making a hospital money or saving a hospital money. And, and that's the big thing I learned in my last company. And if you can't do that in today's economy, um, you know, you can have the best ideas in the world. So the question is, how can we get this to either save a hospital money or make it money? And I think that's that's where we have to think this through to, um, you know, to be successful. So it's more than just the idea. And I'm not going to tell you my thinking about that. I'm going to keep that to myself for right now. 
<laughs> sure, absolutely. Okay, because I didn't make any money on my last company. I got to do it before I retire, so I can retire. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, uh, it doesn't seem like you. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you've had a long and you know a very successful career, but you know, you haven't retired yet. You're still going. What keeps you? You know, what keeps you going? Is it the excitement uh, of new things, of always pushing the envelope? Like, you know. Yeah. Why are you still working? <laughs> what keeps you going? Well, first of all, I, I sort of have to. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> but but I um, it's it's more than that. Is I, I I think I'm I was born with a genetic deficiency in that I have a, a pathological optimism towards life and what I do, and it's just I love what I do, and I've been very fortunate to um, you know to, to to really love what I do, and I that's that's probably a big factor. I mean, if I retired, this is what I do. I start another company and, and do what I do. So um, I think that. Wish some more people had that uh, genetic disorder. <laughs> well, I, I've just been very fortunate about that. And I also had, I guess maybe it was growing up, uh, you know, in the hippie era, you know, many years ago, is I, I, I developed this strong sense that, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you leave the planet, you, you, sh you, you should have changed it even in a tiny way in a positive direction. And um, I, I think I've done that, so I'm happy. And, um, you know, I'll probably want to do that until I'm dead. <laughs> so I think that's all there is well, I mean, really that's a, at the end of the game. Yeah, I mean, but that's a great philosophy to have in it. You know, it shows through, you know, in, in working for you. I mean, it doesn't feel like I'm working for, you know, some big corporate guy. I mean, it feels like I'm working for a human who, you know, genuinely cares. Um, well, and, thanks. You know, it, yeah. It, you know, you're obviously an inspiration to me and I'm sure to many other people. Um, but were there any lessons that you've learned, you know, over your life, um, you know, that you could speak to um, for students or for people looking at this field or just more generally for life? Yeah, well, first of all, let me tell you, it's been a pleasure working with you, too. And I think all of you and your colleagues uh, are just amazing. It, it keeps me alive. <laughs> I mean, it really does. It's like because <laughs> I'm, I'm spent most of my week keeping up with you guys. <laughs> so. So it's been wonderful. I mean, it goes both ways. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, I guess what I, the, the one thing that um, I, I don't, I, you know, after working with you guys uh, and, and your colleagues, I know I'm not the smartest person in the world. I mean, it's, so I don't think that's um, the key feature about me. I think that, um, I think the one thing that, um, that that's helped me along the way is I'm, uh, I'm probably off the charts in being persistent, and that that uh, really was that's what kept my last company going. Um, you know, shutting it down was not an option for me. And there are many times where we didn't have money, and you would think that you know. And if 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 I had investors in my company, they would have pulled the plug. They would have said this isn't going anywhere. And many times that happened. And to me, it wasn't an option. And I just kept going through, and every time we found the money, and we kept going with it. And I, I think you have to be. So there has to be a little bit of. Uh, you can't just if you have, you know, if you have an idea. My my advice is, pursue it and keep going with it, um, unless you have a bad idea, <laughs> and, then, and hopefully you'll be able to determine that soon enough because, you know, that's um, and I think that's part of. You know, part of what you need to do is if you really believe in what you're doing, and you really see this as a good idea, it's got to help people and all that. Then just put all you got it behind it, and uh, don't let anyone say no. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to end it, Dick. It's been really nice having you on for this conversation. Um, thank you for helping me kick off this podcast. Um, it's been great talking to you. Great talking to you, Zach. Thank you.